Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for that little technical difficulty. I've been talking and talking away and I've been muted. So thank you for bearing with me for a second. And I'm, I will go through everything I just said really quickly. So bear with me. Uh, my name is Sarah Pentecost with APA Virginia staff. Thank you for joining us for the monthly webinar series sponsored by the Berkeley Group. Um, just a few quick announcements. The RFP is still open for our annual conference in Hampton, July 21st through the 24th. So if you missed Friday's deadline, go ahead and send them in. You can find that info at virginia.planning.org. We also um, are doing a call for those AICP eligible folks who want to become FAICP. Those letters of interest are due to Julie Pastor. On February 1st. If you have questions about that, email us at info at apavirginia.org. Um, I am going to kind of skip the rest of this so we can get to the point for, um, for those who just signed on. Thank you for joining us for our monthly webinar series, Your Hour with APA Virginia, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. 
Um, this webinar is eligible for one CM credit. You have to watch this live. If you're watching this recording later on, you cannot get a CM credit. I apologize. You can find this info at virginia.planning.org, and we will post the recording to our YouTube page within 24 hours. Please mark your calendar for next month's webinar on February 25th. The topic is TBA, so stay tuned to the newsletters, our website, and our social media. Um, but with that being said, if you're interested in presenting in the future, please contact us at info at apavirginia.com. Today, we're excited to have Lorna Parkins, VP of Transportation Planning at Michael Baker International, presenting Planning for Uncertainty, Exploratory Scenario Planning. Lorna has 30 years of experience in transportation planning and has been an APA member for almost just as long. Lorna serves as the development chapter on our Virginia chapter board of directors and has been with Michael Baker International for 20 years, where she leads the company's mid-Atlantic practice here in Richmond, Virginia. And I will now hand it over to Lorna. Thank you for being with us today. Good afternoon. So um, now I'm unmuted, making sure you all can hear me. All right. Um, <clears throat> there's my screen. And so uh, Sarah said, thanks for joining us this afternoon for the um, APA webinar. And uh, today we're going to talk about exploratory planning for uncertain times. And I like to start this presentation with just a quick story. Um, <clears throat> this is the time of year when we're all uh, paying close attention to the forecast and seeing uh, when we might be dealing with snow or ice. And uh, it reminds me of um, uh, quite a few years ago, I used to live in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania region, and the, the forecasts were just notoriously um, difficult to, uh, to follow because uh, they lived right on the edge of where sometimes they would get Great Lake effect snows and sometimes they wouldn't. And this one winter, uh, every single weekend they would predict, uh, you know, oh, the big snow is coming, the big snow is coming. And it never did, you know, but people always still went out and bought their milk and bread. And we got to the first weekend in March and uh, and they made that same prediction. And, uh, and I remember laughing with my daycare provider uh, on my way home that Friday, like, oh, you know, uh, of course it's going to snow. Well, it snowed three feet. Uh, that weekend, and uh, and I, you know, I had my bread and my milk. We could make all the French toast we wanted, but um, but we had forgotten to stock up on diapers, and we had a, a baby at home at the time. So, uh, so my poor husband had to trudge through three feet of snow to get diapers because, uh, in spite of the forecast, we weren't as prepared as we should be. And that's really what um, what exploratory planning is about. It's about being prepared. Um, we. Um, how to advance this? Okay, uh, uh, as as planners, and um, and I have economics in my background as well. Um, you know, we rely on the past and the the relationships uh, of uh, and correlations between uh, different factors uh, that we can see in the past to um, to help us predict the future, uh, and that's really uh, what we do. So you know like the the weather forecasters you know we do our best and uh, and sometimes uh, it turns out to to be the case and sometimes it doesn't um, but the point of exploratory planning as i said is really to think about how to be prepared so if we're using the information about the past to predict the future what happens when those relationships get disrupted uh, that's really one of the big themes we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and so here's some data that um, that help explain how in the past um, the amount of growth in vehicle travel, VMT, was very closely correlated to the amount of economic growth. Uh, and then around 2004, all of a sudden those trends decoupled. And, uh, and when that sort of thing happens, when we have those disruptions, it really becomes difficult to think about the future. Uh, how are we going to predict the future if those if those relationships and those uh, correlations are unpredictable? And there are a lot of different things that cause uh, that uncertainty. Um, we tend to call them disruptors. Uh, so some of them are related to technology advances. Uh, as you'll see in this presentation, I'm a transportation planner, so a lot of what I'm focusing on relates to transportation planning, but it's very applicable to other areas of planning. 
Um, but, you know, in the area of technology and also some of our um, uh, economy as well, technology advances are making it very hard to predict um, very far out in the future right now. Changing values and globalization um, of the economy, those are other disruptors, and I'm sure you can think of some um, additional ones. One of the ones that we talk about a lot in the planning community is generational changes. Uh, each generation forms their values really at a young age and those values affect their choices throughout their lives. Um, and so, you know, we're all tuning into the millennials um, as they've entered adulthood in the last 10 years and now we're starting to look at the generation behind them as well, Gen Z. Um, and those different values, they govern life choices. So uh, think about, you know, contrasting the boomers with the millennials. I'm a boomer and, uh, you know, rule number one when I was a kid is you don't get in a car with someone you don't know. Um, but, uh, but the sharing economy that's so important to the millennial generation is really changing uh, how we behave and, uh, and the fact that you can stay connected and get things done while riding transit has, uh, has really decreased uh, our use of, um, you know, our, our rates of, uh, of having driver's licenses and, and owning autos. And those are things that are just starting to take shape and we're starting to have a little bit of data on some of these, but, uh, but predicting them long term is really tricky and, uh, and difficult. So that's where um, this type of planning can really help out. Some other disruptors uh, on the economic side, we've got um, the theme of this slide is micro productions. So you've got 3D printing, you've got, um, you know, if you walk into some restaurants, you've got a machine the size of a refrigerator that delivers every kind of Coca-Cola product. And um, that may not seem revolutionary, but it is when you think of the fact that, you know, you used to need a whole entire bottling plant to do that. Uh, and the thing is, the same is true. Pharmaceuticals are doing the same kind of micro production within hospitals and the like. So that changes the kind of distribution of inputs and finished goods that occurs in our transportation system and has many other um, implications. Uh, similarly, uh, the the change towards home shopping, uh, the way that we're delivering packages, uh, those are really affecting many different aspects of society. We're starting to see them affect what happens in our shopping centers, um, as well as uh, the transportation patterns uh, from neighborhoods to highways and everything in between. So as we think about these disruptors, some of the aspects that we look at are opportunities and some of them are threats, but it's important to really think through, you know, what are the drivers and, and what's really starting to change. Um, and that's true across uh, all the drivers that we're going to talk about today. Technology is the same. This slide is about transportation technology. We need to think about autonomous and connected vehicles, and I might use CAV as shorthand for that, uh, or connected and automated vehicles. Um, there's um, autonomous transit, which is on the lower left of this slide, and then connected vehicles, which is the more immediate um, set of changes, has to do with the vehicle communicating with the infrastructure, um, with other vehicles, with people, and the infrastructure communicating directly to the vehicle without necessarily even having the driver be involved in the response. So um, there's a lot happening there that uh, that change is going to change how our transportation system performs and what kind of investments we need to make. And then the last area of drivers that I'll talk about throughout the presentation is environmental, um, and these can include sea level rise, severe weather, um, the implementation of electric vehicles, uh, some of these are, um, uh, you know, we need to think about the things that are causal. So these are things that are sort of out of our control and that are causing change to our communities and our, our transportation planning. There are many other aspects of the environment that we might put um, in the other side of the analysis, which is, is looking at um, performance and, and outputs. So we're going to do polls today. Um, this is the first one. And what you can do is you can actually click on your screen to uh, participate in the poll. And the first question is just to get a sense of how concerned you all are about the influence of disruptors on your community's plans for the future. So we're just gonna give you a few seconds to pick one of those responses, whether you strongly agree or strongly disagree or somewhere in between. And we're gonna go ahead and close the poll in three, two, one, it's closed. And, um, the responses that you can see um, are people generally agree 
Some are not sure, nobody strongly disagrees, and some people, about a third of you strongly agree that you are concerned about the influence of disruptors. So great, so that's a great um, uh, foundation for the discussion today. Uh, and I'm gonna um, move into the next part of the presentation now, um, which will be uh, an overview of what we do in exploratory planning. Um, and I wanted to mention that um, I'll use the terms exploratory planning and exploratory scenario planning interchangeably. Um, I Sometimes it's just for space. I also worked with one um, NPO that uh, they were a little burned out on scenario planning. Um, so we, we pulled that word out of some of the um, slides, but, uh, but I use them interchangeably. So the point of exploratory planning is to be prepared for uncertain times. You want to look at the, uh, you know, the different drivers of change and ask some critical questions. Maybe the most important question that we focus on analytically is what is the range of outcomes that could occur? Uh, the best way to be prepared is to, you know, as they say, um, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So, so this is really uh, about being prepared. Um, and then as we put some information to the question of what could happen in the future, we want to ask ourselves, what are the risks of this future and what are the opportunities? And then that's going to help us shape our, our actions in terms of uh, investments and policies. Now, I want to just take a moment and reference um, normative versus exploratory scenario planning. Normative scenarios, which is the kind of scenario planning that, that we in the industry have been doing for almost 30 years now, um, is really asking what should happen. So you're examining questions like how should your community grow or what investments should we make? And then you're just, you're finding out what people's preferences are and matching their values to the right uh, future and really selecting one future that you want to pursue. Exploratory scenarios really focus on the question of what could happen and things that are outside of your control. Um, so you're asking a lot of what if questions and then identifying risks, shaping your tactics to handle those risks and trying to optimize your chances of success. So it is very different from uh, the normative scenario planning. We use some of the same tools, but we're using them in a different way and our approach, uh, uh, particularly the goal of the exercise is quite different. So the process starts with drivers and uh, you wanna ask yourself, um, some questions about them. Uh, the, the standard set of drivers uh, is listed on the left there, and um, it is, uh, I'm not sure what that's about. <clears throat> the standard set of drivers is uh, listed on the left, uh, and this is a lot of literature is out there uh, driving towards these four sort of buckets of drivers, but Certainly there are others you could introduce. Um, and then if you're doing, say, a transportation exercise, you want to link those drivers to the kinds of outcomes that you're concerned about for your planning exercise. So listed here are some examples of some transportation outcomes that might be affected by each of the drivers. Um, when you're going through the exercise of looking at drivers, you want to ask yourself two questions that are represented by the um, graphic on the right. How important is the impact of that driver to the planning exercise that you're doing, in this case, transportation, and then also how uncertain is it? And you want to hone in on drivers that really land in that upper right quadrant, because the things that have a high impact and are also highly uncertain are the right kinds of things to focus on in a scenario planning exercise like this. Now, to build the, the scenarios, uh, you want to hone in again on those drivers that you've identified as being both important and, uh, and highly uncertain. And then also the levers that you have to affect those um, drivers. That's one of the important things that you use to differentiate between your scenarios. Uh, and then together those create the outcomes that you're going to examine to help uh, understand how to be prepared and that range of outcomes that could occur. So you've got uh, the four basic components then are the drivers, the scenarios, the inputs um, that are created by the combination of the drivers and the scenarios, and then finally the outcomes. Um, and with that information, you can examine risks and opportunities, and you can use it in two important ways. The first is preparedness, and with preparedness, 
you're thinking about which policies and investments produce optimal results across all the possible scenarios. In other words, which ones, in other words, which ones are the most robust um, and, and have value no matter what happens in the future. And then the other way to use this information is responsiveness. So after you've fleshed out your scenarios and, and review the outcomes, you can track over time which scenario is getting closer to reality and that means you've already thought about what is the right thing to do in that situation and that could help shape your responsiveness and just make you more nimble in that situation so getting from the drivers um, through to the to the inputs for the scenarios and ultimately the outputs um, involves a process of creating what I call a chain of logic uh, all of this work is very speculative and it can be uncomfortable but um, but each step is grounded in research and, um, and analysis. And so you start with that driver uh, and you find out the latest and greatest information about it. What are the current predictions? Um, what kind of data do we have to describe any correlations that are happening, say, between the use of um, uh, mobility on demand or t transportation network companies and, uh, and how much uh, single occupant vehicle travel growth is happening. That's the thing that we, we're just starting to have data on right now. So get, go out there and gather that data to help shape your driver. Then really think about how does that affect behavior over time? And that's another route of research. And you might want to talk to experts. You might want to, um, to do focus groups um, to find out, uh, you know, if this is the, the disruptor that's happening, how is behavior going to change? And then when you have a good sense of what the behavioral change is, then you can translate that to the impacts. Um, and again, this is where you might uh, use your models that you have at hand um, and other analytical uh, techniques. Now, defining the scenarios is something you want to do that right up front. That's the urge that you have. Uh, but it's, it's important to drive towards scenarios that are both internally consistent so each one is kind of telling a consistent story but then also across the scenarios you're really going to produce a range of outcomes the range of outcomes is critical if you do all this work and the results of the scenarios aren't that different from each other um, it's very frustrating uh, and it's something you have to be thinking about from the very beginning you want to avoid that uh, particular outcome and the, the force that you're working against is that people want the scenarios to be realistic. Um, and of course you want, you want them to be realistic too, but there are times in the process where you have to kind of push what you're testing uh, and your what if questions a little bit to the extreme so that you can be sure that you, you learn from them. Because that's the point. The point is not to have the perfect crystal ball of what's going to happen because we know we can't make a perfect prediction, but we do want to have a good range of outcomes where the the results of each scenario are, are teaching us something. So, so as a result of that dynamic, you do sometimes have to refine the scenarios a bit after you do some of that research that we talked about in the last slide and you find out, wait, this part of my scenario is going to sort of cancel out the effect of that other part of my scenario. So let's realign things a little bit. And then, um, you know, that last piece is the outputs. And, uh, and you really want to define the outputs in terms that are meaningful to the plan that you're preparing for. So um, for a statewide transportation plan or an MPO plan, the ones on the left would be very relevant that relate to travel, um, you know, personal travel, mode split, uh, freight, uh, ton miles of travel, delay and safety and so on. And then, you know, if you're doing more of a community or environmental impact, there might be some other performance measures that you want to include um, as well. Uh, and there, there are many, many more um, than, uh, than I've listed here. And I will have a slide at the very end with some additional resources for you to look at. So it's time for our next poll. And um, we want to ask, with regard to future uncertainty, uh, pick one of the answers that you see on the screen. Uh, give us a sense of how appealing this approach is to, to the kind of planning questions you're addressing in your community. And um, I'm going to give you just a few more seconds about it. And we're going to close the poll in three, two, one. All right, so let's see the results. Oh, good. All right. So, um, so far, many of you are thinking that exploratory scenario planning would be beneficial. A few of you are concerned that it might be costly, complicated, or confusing. 
Um, and a few of you think that maybe the best strategy is focusing on near-term planning. And that's a logical thing to do and maybe a prudent thing to do regardless. Um, I'm seeing a trend with some uh, long-range planning requirements where some of the planning is shifting to near-term and then they're using scenario planning in the longer term. And that's a good sort of a one-two punch. So uh, thank you for participating. That's really helpful. All right, so moving on then. Um, now I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the process of building and evaluating exploratory scenarios. And of course, in the time we have, um, I can't really get into a lot of detail, but hopefully um, you'll get a sense of how it works uh, and some confidence that uh, it's something that you, you can do regardless of the amount of resources that you have, because there's different levels at which you can conduct this kind of exercise. So, um, so at the very beginning, you want to hone in on the purpose of your scenario planning and your exploratory planning, um, thinking about what investments are you concerned about, what policies do you need to develop and manage, and what risks and outcomes are of concern. So when you look at some of the examples of, that have been done out there, um, a lot of them deal with technology. Some of them really are focused on transportation planning because, of course, transportation planners have these requirements for long-range planning that are pretty much requiring them to ask some of these questions. But, um, but some examples also get into really important questions about the environment, too. And um, the next thing I want to mention is that there's, there's some filters that you want to keep in mind. These are sort of like post-it notes you'd want to have in front of you throughout the whole exercise. Uh, because the thing about scenario planning is it is complicated and thinking about the future is fun but you have and, and interesting but you have got to constantly be asking yourself is this trend related um, and not go off on tangents with trends that aren't related to your core questions. Secondly, you want to ask if you have any influence over it. If you can't influence it, uh, then it's going to be hard to do different things with that trend in your um, in your scenario analysis. Now, maybe it belongs in your baseline scenario, but um, but think about whether you really have any influence over it as, as part of screening in what you're going to include in your scenarios. Um, similarly, will it produce variation in the outcomes? Uh, if it's going to drive everything towards the same outcome, then um, you got to be careful about that, uh, as I was just saying a few moments ago. Uh, and then, you know, be cognizant of whether you can use data to help drive develop and uh, and relay your assumptions throughout the scenario exercise and uh, and also distinguish cause from effect and I mentioned that earlier this one is really tricky with the environmental drivers because there are a lot of environmental um, conditions that we're concerned about but some of them uh, let's say if we're doing transportation planning you know sea level rise definitely has an impact on the transportation infrastructure um, uh, but then you know the carbon emissions of the transportation, the amount of travel and everything may in turn affect climate change. So, you know, that one you can carry all the way through, but others may just belong more at the, as a cause or others are more of an effect. So be clear in your thinking about that as you look at the, the different drivers. And now I want to talk a little bit about what I, I think of as our toolkit in scenario, in exploratory scenario planning. And really, it's just the different kinds of data that we have to work with that allow us to go through this exercise. Um, so uh, some of the, the data is really basic stuff like within the demographic data, um, you look at the generations. They're kind of a tool that you can use for thinking about you know, maybe in this scenario, you attract more millennials. In this scenario, you, you attract more uh, retiring boomers. There's data about those generations out there that you can use to help um, quantify those results. Uh, there's a lot of economic data to use and thinking about the industry mix and what works in your region and what might happen in the future um, is another part of the toolkit. In environment and energy, um, you've got uh, the impacts on the you know, information about the transportation system and user costs, and then thinking about how they can be influenced by those uh, environmental factors. And transportation, um, you have a lot of information about the transportation system, um, and then the technology component of that is gonna affect both system demand and performance. And we're actually gonna do a little bit deeper dive on that particular one. A critical piece of the exploratory planning toolkit is linking land use and transportation. Uh, now, of course, this is especially important in, if you're doing transportation planning, but it's also important in, in, uh, in almost any kind of scenario uh, 
planning that you might do because um, these two are so closely connected uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where people live and how those choices affect uh, their use of the transportation system and how those choices affect the environment and other things. And um, so the typical uh, approach to this is to develop place types. And I'm going to use some examples from um, the statewide planning work we did for VTrans 2040, which is the last um, long range statewide plan in Virginia, uh, and the first one to do this kind of a scenario exercise. And um, so for that exercise, we looked at um, people and jobs per acre and transit accessibility, and we came up with this spectrum of six place types that exist today, and then we also developed a seventh one to use in the future. And the importance is of them is that they help you identify areas that have noticeable differences in travel behavior as it relates to land use patterns. Um, so this is just one example of the place types that you could develop. And if you map them across Virginia, um, that's what they look like. They had distinct profiles of mode split and demographics and trip rates. And the beauty of doing these things in GIS is that you can, once you define an area, you can pull out the characteristics of that area in some other regard, like the age profile or um, what have you. And the other way that it's very helpful is creating distinctions in the assumptions that we made about technology implementation later on exercise and I'll come back to that. So for, so for your exploratory planning exercise in your, um, uh, in your community, you want to think about the critical distinctions that make one part of the community function differently than another, whether it's travel modes, walkability, um, trip generation, jobs, housing balance. Uh, it could be things that aren't on the screen like, uh, you know, if you have very um, highly industrial areas or if you have a port or, you know, things that are just unique and that unique aspect of land use is linked to other things that you care about, like the, um, the transportation and environmental factors. So let's do um, one more, another poll. And I'm asking, as you think about these drivers and the kinds of scenarios you might put together, what are the things that would affect your plans? And you can pick more than one on this one. Um, so thinking, would you be thinking most about development patterns, demographics, transportation technology, um, economic sectors and job growth, or maybe other things? So um, go ahead and take the poll. And I'll give you a little bit of extra time since you can pick more than one. I'm thinking about what's most important for the planning you might undertake. It looks like it's slowing down, so we'll close the poll in three, two, one. Okay, closed. And all right, so um, so we got a lot of interest in focusing on development patterns, and uh, and then demographic and economic were pretty um, even in second place, and then uh, transportation technology is also of interest to the majority of people. And then some people had some other drivers too. And so when we open it up for discussion at the end, um, if you want to circle back to talking about some different drivers, uh, feel free to do that. That would be interesting to talk about. Okay. So, um, so let's walk through some example scenarios and how uh, the process, we're going just a little bit deeper now into how we approach the analytical process. Um, this is uh, the four scenarios that we came up with for VTrans 2040. We had high growth industrial, which we called industrial renaissance, which was less urban growth, uh, or actually it was really a kind of a status quo of the distribution of growth as it was uh, in our base year. Uh, then high growth, high tech with a more urban profile was Techtopia. Uh, moderate growth, but with older demographics and a focus on walkable places with silver age, and then a reduced growth scenario with slower adoption of technology was um, was examined in the fourth scenario we call general slowdown. And um, this graphic gives you an idea of, if you think about some of the, um, the drivers, um, like the location, um, the adoption of autonomous vehicle technology, et cetera, it shows you how much we differentiated um, the 
uh, differences in how those drivers played out for each of the scenarios. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So uh, one thing I wanted to um, emphasize, though, is that uh, just for practical reasons, the analytical process um, can most easily start with the economic forecasts. If you're going, if you're going to vary your economic forecasts across the scenarios, that is really a good place to start because you can um, uh, create a, a kind of a point of entry for changing the future through the economic drivers. You might even have access to a simulation model where you have a model that can help you come up with those alternative um, future forecasts. But even if you don't, um, you can still use research and the explicit assumptions you've made in your scenarios and um, information about the context of your community to come up with uh, some basic decisions about how much you're going to vary uh, future employment um, and come up with reasonable forecasts. And that helps drive uh, the whole process of coming up with your scenario inputs. So, um, so that's really a good starting point, especially if you're doing like a regional planning exercise. Um, uh, as you know, the, that part of your socioeconomic data really drives a lot of uh, what's happening uh, throughout your whole analytical uh, set of data. Uh, so if you start with the, the change in jobs and you've identified that by different sectors and you've also got different characters, freight oriented characteristics of the jobs in mind, um, then you can balance the jobs to your future population forecast using the um, uh, labor force participation rate. So now you're creating internal consistency on the basis of, um, of the increase in jobs. And that's just a little bit more robust than just sort of arbitrarily saying, well, let's see what happens if we had 10% more population growth. You're kind of creating a, a more internally consistent set of assumptions. And then you also want to think about what you're assuming about generations. And then that leads you to allocating growth. So you can allocate the growth uh, geographically um, uh, at, at using these different tools. Uh, for VTRANS, um, which is the allocation I'm going to illustrate here, we were just doing this uh, really in a spreadsheet. It was a sketch planning exercise, but, um, but we're getting started on a scenario exercise uh, in one of the Virginia regions right now where we are um, we're developing a land use model. And there are also standalone land use models that you can use to, to do this step. So um, how you know detailed it is uh, can really vary based on the tools that you decide to use and the investment you're making. So in this um, exercise, then, if you remember what I said a few moments ago about how we uh, assumed growth would be different in the scenarios, watch the purple bars. So industrial renaissance had more growth. Everything in the middle represents the future baseline forecast of growth. And, um, and so for industrial renaissance, you see we have more growth kind of across all the place types. Techtopia, we put less of the growth in the more rural areas and more in the higher density areas. Silver age, we were emphasizing the smaller town walkable communities. So we put more of the growth into the, um, to those middle uh, place types. And then general slowdown, we basically, relative to the baseline, we were reducing the amount of future growth um, in the more urban areas. So when you add all that up together, um, by making those assumptions in our allocation, we came up with some really substantial differences between the forecasts. Um, so this is the stacked bar chart by place type, and it shows you that um, in the higher growth scenarios, we had over half a million more people than we had in the lower growth scenarios. So that's a good differential. And then we also had more, almost a million more people living in high density areas in that techtopia scenario um, compared to the general slowdown scenario. So again, trying to create differentiation in how you go through the steps of the scenario process is an important driver of what you're doing. Um, now, incorporating technology drivers is, um, is challenging. There's a, a growing list of resources out there that I'll touch on in a few minutes to help you with this. But uh, again, this is about creating that chain of logic. You're thinking about the drivers themselves, like mobility as a service and connected and automated vehicles, and asking these questions, um, you know, what do I need to assume about this to be able to show a, a change in the future that's going to lead me to some uh, some meaningful outcomes. So some of the things to think about are how do they affect, um, how much 
will they be implemented uh, in the future? By 2040, will we have, you know, 80% or 90% or 100% of the fleet in connected and autonomous vehicles? What are the user costs? Um, what effect will the mode have on demand? What will effect will have on performance and mode choice? And then the key is when you start to get a grip on these things, you're going to vary what you assume by scenario and also by place type, and that's going to help you create very different outcomes uh, in total. So one of those first questions is, what's the level of implementation in the future? Well, we in Btrans, we did some outreach, and we asked people, where do you want to live in 2040, and how do you think you'll get around? And it was really interesting. We saw this correlation uh, where people who saw themselves in more rural places didn't envision um, having somebody else drive them around, but rather thought they would still own their own vehicle. And they also had slightly less inclination to, uh, to adopting um, autom automated or autonomous vehicles. So we reflected that in our assumptions. We backed this up with some research. And um, so this variation by place type in those assumptions was a core uh, lever that we had inside of our scenario planning exercise. And then by scenario, we just kind of moved these lines up or down as well. And so together, that created quite a bit of, um, of differentiation between the scenarios and their outcomes. The, uh, you know, the other question I uh, mentioned you want to ask about technology is how is it going to affect demand? There's a growing body of research on this now um, showing that, that a lot of latent demand for transportation is likely to be unleashed by, unleashed by technology, for example, from seniors, from um, youth. Uh, also, the convenience factor and the fact that some cars will be driving around with zero occupants will uh, will also drive up demand. Um, the value of time is going to be affected, and that could lead to longer commutes. And then, and then we also foresee that um, in urban areas, in particular, there will be less circulation for parking, so that might actually drive down demand. So, there, think you have to think through all of these different. Uh, behavioral aspects in your chain of logic, um, but of course, really use research. Unfortunately, there's a growing body body of research to, to support that now. Um, uh, transit uh, as well. We can't just think of today's transit. We have to think about tomorrow's transit. It really could become more affordable, more widely available. The way that the information technology is affecting transit um, and trip making is also very important. So we got to use the latest information and then and then think that through. And then just as demand is likely to increase, the ability of the transportation system to absorb that man demand also will be improved in the future. Um, there'll be more efficiency based on the, the all the communication between vehicles and the infrastructure and the physically uh, vehicles can travel closer to each other. And then just the improvements in safety are really going to um, have a benefit in terms of congestion. So um, in the VTrans exercise to help get a grip on those changes, we thought we, we use the research to help us identify which types of facilities would have different levels of um, capacity improvement or effective capacity um, with, uh, you know, with the advancement of technology. And then we use the data about the um, functional classification system to help us identify what the information we have in the table, which tells us, you know, which of the um, place types have higher concentrations of the higher level facilities that are likely to um, reap the greatest benefits from the advancements in technology. So again, that's just one example. If you have a travel demand model that you can use, then that's really a matter of um, telling the model, you know, the, the limits that we have on vehicles per hour and lane capacity can be increased. And so that's a different way of, of using the same lever, but with a different tool. Uh, and then with the environmental drivers, again, the same kind of change of logic such as if you're thinking about um, electronic vehicles asking if they'll affect behavior um, if the cost of using them uh, goes down will they affect land use or other factors integral to behavior as well as system performance and um, and while we're thinking through this chain of logic if, if fuel is our source of revenue um, what happens uh, you know to that revenue source when electric vehicles become more widespread so um, so that's an example of, of thinking through uh, a set of drivers. So when you, after you've laid out all of that information and you've done all the research, you really get to the point where you're um, able to, to hunker down and process the results. And as I said earlier, you don't have to have uh, an integrated modeling set to do this. We did the VTrans exercise with um, GIS data and spreadsheets. 
and, uh, and produce a sketch planning type of exercise. And what you get from that is not as precise. Um, you get relative increases and decreases in your performance measures. You get ranges of potential outcomes uh, that are more general and, uh, and you get more qualitative findings. Um, in the integrated scenario modeling approach where you develop everything through a, a land use model and a travel demand model, you do get more quantitative results, you get mappable results, which um, in turn gives you greater insight into congestion and some secondary effects. So in the sketch planning approach, you might be able to say, well, we think there will be more congestion in urban areas under this scenario. But with an integrated modeling set, you can say these roadways have more congestion and these roadways have less congestion. Um, so it is definitely more precise. But you have to keep in mind that the whole thing is really a lot of, um, of speculation. So uh, if what you want to get to is, is the questions uh, about the future, you may be fine with the sketch approach. And, um, and the point of this slide is really that from my experience, the most important thing is to have the discussion, um, to take the time to think through what are those drivers that can affect your community in the future, apply the, you know, the research and the, um, uh, the other techniques that, that we've talked about to uh, putting forth some speculation about what happens in the future, and then having that conversation. Um, and, and then visualizing what that might look like uh, and taking that out to your uh, policymakers and, and, and the public and others to find out what the, the response is. Um, as I've said throughout the presentation, uh, the most important thing to do for, um, for this type of scenario planning is identify the risks and the opportunities. For example, um, Safety is a tremendous opportunity, and it and the improvements in safety in transportation will uh, also really improve the performance of the transportation system. But um, you know, so that insight might lead you to think, uh, well, we will really want to prioritize the aspects of our investments that are going to get us to those safety benefits. But the number one hurdle to that is is human. Um, behavior and that is uh, is willingness to adopt uh, giving up control of the vehicle that we're in and um, uh, the USDOT has really uh, just recently announced that's one of their priority focus areas now is uh, is hum is acceptance of um, of automated and autonomous vehicles so um, so that's the that's the kind of conversation you can have around this, and it allows you to think about what are what are the things we need that we're not doing that we need to start thinking about today, um, and it just gives you uh, a sense of uh, instead of feeling overwhelmed by these future trends, um, it gives you a sense of what you can do, and then uh, with those ideas in mind, you can start developing some policies that will help you to be prepared. Uh, that's the preparedness piece that we talked about earlier. And then uh, in the responsiveness piece, what you want to do is you want to monitor trends, uh, impacts, and investments over time. Once you've done a scenario exercise, go back and say, well, so, you know, a few years later, are we um, converging on one of these scenarios more so than the others? What did we learn from that scenario and how can we apply it to be prepared? So this is the final poll, and then we're going to open it up to questions and answers. So just um, take a look at these statements and see which one best fits your opinion about um, exploratory planning. A few seconds to register your responses. And starting to slow down, so we'll close the poll in three, Two, one, all right, closed. And um, well, good. So um, just over half of you are saying that exploratory planning seems helpful and doable. Uh, I feel good about that uh, doable result because I think it, it can be uh, seem overwhelming um, uh, at the outset. 37% uh, said um, it seems like it would be helpful, but it might require too many resources. And, um, and I think that's also a very understandable reaction. And so, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in exploratory planning, I really encourage you to look at the literature that's out there um, 
and see, you know, what applies because sometimes you can pivot off of someone else's work and uh, and learn a lot without having to make a big investment of your own. Um, one of the regions we work with um, up in Pittsburgh, they decided to take a pretty qualitative approach to the whole thing, um, and they they brought research in in the form of presentations. They did online. Um, uh, surveys to and then some in-person um, forums uh, focusing on the different issues in their region and they've gone through that process in a much more qualitative fashion to um, to come up with some of the same kinds of results so there's a lot of different ways you can approach it so here's some resources for you um, FHWA has a scenario planning web page that is uh, at the link listed there and Sometime this year, probably pretty soon, um, they're putting out a next gen scenario planning guidebook, which um, in which they went through six uh, different scenarios around technology and related drivers, and uh, and they have some really helpful insights uh, and some things again that you might be able to pivot off of and not have to create the wheel in your own scenario exercise. Um, and then TRB is doing a lot of research in this area. They put out NCHRP 896 just a month ago um, that has a wealth of information on how to uh, incorporate technology and um, and related um, aspects of uh, transportation behavior on uh, into travel demand modeling and scenario exercises. And then I'm, I mentioned state of Maryland and state of Oregon, they have done a lot of work of with integrated scenario models that include a strong environmental component so that may be of interest to you and um, and then two um, just over two years ago HRTPO here in Virginia did an FHWA sponsored scenario planning workshop and they have all of that material on their page that includes some presentations from Atlanta Regional Commission which is one of the first MPOs to do um, this kind of uh, scenario planning and um, so that is also a good resource. And that's the end of the presentation. So I would like to open it up for questions and discussion. Yes, thank you, everyone. <laughs> yes, today, <laughs> we, we have some time for questions. So if you want to get something, go ahead and type it in the questions box and we will go through them. Um, ready? So first question is with the land use purview under local jurisdictions, how does the state and MPOs driven long range transportation plans incorporate it? And there's a second part to that question as well. If you want me to read it now or wait. Um, how does a preferred scenario work in exploratory scenario planning for a constrained plan? I can see a normative scenario planning might work. I see exploratory scenario planning might work for a vision plan. Okay, those are some really good um, questions. So um, it is true that uh, it's uh, very speculative to go out and uh, and do this kind of exercise when you're making some different um, assumptions about future land use when uh, when obviously local governments are the ones who have uh, who regulate land use. So uh, and I will say that's where the place types really come in handy. And so in the Virginia exercise, one of the things we did with the um, with the sketch planning approach was to be able to make generalizations to place type without having to say a whole lot about geographically specific um, outcomes. And, um, and similarly, within an MPO, um, if you keep the level at which you're discussing things to place types, it, um, it, it has more general um, application. Um, however, if you're doing a you know, full-blown land use model, then you do, you know, you do have to get into, you know, geographic specificity. And um, so one of the ways to handle that is to keep the exploratory scenario planning in the realm of the speculative. So, um, so while it might be more like a vision plan exercise, if, if what you do is to examine your potential investments across the scenarios and see which ones hold up better across all the scenarios, that can still be helpful to your constrained long range plan. Because, um, you know, you're, instead of um, doing what you do in normative scenario planning, which is to say, this is our preferred future land use, you're saying, how do the investments hold up across different alternative future land uses? Um, and, you know, in reality, 
we don't have control over where people decide to live. So, um, so that is, um, is actually a useful way of employing this technique. Next question uh, from Kevin Banks. So what so difference does scenario, scenario make regionally when FHWA dictates that CLRTP must be based on adopted local comm plans, which don't reflect scenario plannings or regional outcomes? Um, well, so, I mean, take a look at the FHWA scenario planning page because I think, you know, they do encourage looking at alternative futures um, and uh, and when it, it, I don't, it's actually I don't think it's FHWA that drives you to use the, the state forecasts. Um, uh, there's more it's more like a tradition um, to use the um, the forecast from your state data center. Uh, and uh, and some regions have been able to make some exceptions to that. Um, if you but you have to have your own forecasts to to replace them with or to to base the modification on. Um, but um, it 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 does seem like a, a catch twenty two, right? That here, well here we've got these forecasts that we're supposed to use. They're providing the socioeconomic data to our travel demand model. Um, so you know who says we can play around with that in the in the future, but. Um, one of the things that's nice about exploratory scenario planning is, uh, as I was saying in answer to the previous question, you're, you're using it as an exercise to test whether your transportation investments are as effective across these different scenarios, not, um, not picking which ones fit with which scenario, like you do in normative scenario planning, but you can actually test uh, your investments against each of the scenarios, uh, and that allows you to sort of measure how, how robust they are if you have one regional development pattern versus if you have another. So, um, so it is, you know, it is speculation and it is uncomfortable, but there are ways to construct the exercise that can still bring information back to answering questions about, um, you know, how good uh, potential investments might hold up in the future. So I hope that answered the question. All right, any other questions, go ahead and send them in. No, those are the only two for now. Um, in the meantime, I'll just remind everyone to look out for the newsletter following up to this webinar with information on how to log your CM credit and um, some other announcements. And I'll wait just another second here. And then just a reminder to stay tuned for the February webinar. Um, oh, one more question also from Kevin Burns. So what works best to engage elected officials to think beyond their term of office? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, and um, I think it, there's definitely a, a range of reactions that occurs when you start talking about these things that are that are kind of speculative in the future. But um, you know, helping to remind people that the investment choices we make today have a big role in our preparedness um, for the future and, uh, and also making some of those linkages to important things like funding and funding sources, revenue sources, um, helps uh, drive home the importance uh, of thinking through these issues for the longer term. Uh, we all know how long it takes to change uh, you know our funding mechanisms. Uh, again, I'm, I'm mostly tuned into transportation, but um, but I'm sure there are similar examples at the local level. And uh, and knowing that we're heading in a direction that is sustainable financially um, is maybe one way to help motivate uh, elected officials who have that shorter-term focus. Alrighty, so I think that's it. Um, thank you, Lorna, for being with us today. I think that was a great webinar, and thanks everyone for joining us. We had a lot of attendees today, so I hope that you all found that very educational and helpful for your current jobs or future plans. And remember to check out virginia.planning.org for the latest APA Virginia happenings, and I hope you have a great rest of your Monday.